This video will discuss the infrared spectra of diatomic molecules using the harmonic oscillator model. Okay, so for the harmonic oscillator model, we have two atoms and with mass 1 and mass 2. They are connected by a covalent bond. The strength of that covalent bond is measured by a spring constant K, which specifies our potential energy function. V of x equals 1 half kx squared, where x is the displacement away from the equilibrium bond length, r naught, where x equals r minus r naught, with r being the current bond length. So a positive value of x is displacement beyond the minimum energy bond length, and a negative value is a displacement inside the equilibrium bond length. Okay, so in the previous video, we solved the Schrodinger equation, H psi equals E psi, for the energy levels of the harmonic oscillator, where our potential energy in the Hamiltonian was this 1 half kx squared. In that case, we got that the energy as the function of a quantum number n equals H nu times n plus 1 half, where n was some integer starting at 0 and going up to infinity. Nu is the angular frequency of the system, which is equal to 1 over 2 pi, square root of k over mu. And mu is the reduced mass of the system, which we use as the mass in the kinetic energy operator, which is going to be equal to mass 1 times mass 2, divided by mass 1 plus mass 2. So when one atom is much, much heavier than the other, mu becomes almost the lighter one, and when the masses are equal, it becomes one half of that mass. Okay, so our energy levels are one half h nu, three halves h nu, five halves h nu. We're going up by a value of h nu every time as we increase to another quantum of energy. So for diatomic molecules in vibrational spectroscopy, so this is a model of vibrating atoms, when we go up from one energy level to another, our so-called selection rule for when we absorb a photon and get a new quantum of energy, that, that selection rule is that delta n equals plus or minus 1. So when delta n equals plus 1, our final n is greater than our initial n by 1. That's an absorption. We have absorbed a photon of energy, and it has pushed us up one more quantum in energy. When delta n equals minus 1, our final state is lower in energy than our initial state, and we have decreased by one quantum of energy by emitting a photon, so that is emission. Um, most molecules at the, are at the n equals 0 state at 298 Kelvin. Uh, in thermodynamics, we discussed statistical mechanics a little bit, and it happens to work out that when you compute the values of k and mu that you're substituting in here, that most molecules at 298 Kelvin, for the most part, are going to be sitting down at n equals 0. So for the most part, we're talking about either going from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0 for absorption and emission. Okay, so our delta E is going to equal h nu of the photon, h nu observed, so nu observed is the frequency of the photon that we absorb. That's going to equal the final minus the initial energy. In the case of absorption, that's e n plus 1 minus e n. So that is equal to h nu of n plus 1 plus 1 half, substituting in n plus 1 for n here, minus e of n, h nu n plus 1 half. Okay, so what we see there is that the n plus 1 half cancels. What we're left with is just an h nu times 1. So our h nu observed, the frequency of our photon, is equal to h times the frequency of our oscillator. So the nu observed, the frequency of the photon that we absorbed to go up one quantum in energy, is the same as our nu of our system. It's 1 over 2 pi square root of k over mu. So that's in units of hertz, 1 over seconds. Typically, k is in the units of newtons per meter, which would be uh, kilograms per second squared. And mu is typically in kilograms as well. So inside here, we have 1 over seconds squared. Square root of that is 1 over seconds, which is hertz. 
Okay, but sometimes spectroscopists don't like to use the unit hertz. Sometimes they like to use the unit wave numbers. So we can get where wave numbers comes from by looking at the properties of, of waves and light for a little bit. So the speed of light, C, is equal to the wavelength of the light times its frequency, lambda times nu. So nu, the frequency of the light, equals speed of light divided by the wavelength. So instead, what we could look at is the inverse wavelength, omega bar, which is 1 over lambda. So omega bar is nu divided by the speed of light, which is equal to, as I said, the inverse wavelength. So if we do this with a speed of light in units of centimeters per second, then what we get is an omega bar in units of inverse centimeters. And this is a convenient unit for plotting these types of energy transitions, which are typically in the hundreds or thousands of wave numbers in this infrared region of the spectrum. So the only difference between nu and omega bar is now we throw in an additional division by the speed of light. Omega bar equals 1 over 2 pi c times the square root of k over mu. Okay, so that's it. That's what our frequency is. So we can do an example here, um, and we can see how if we're given the if we're given the inverse wavelength or the wave numbers of the transition, we can derive, given the molecule, what the spring constant is. Or if we know the spring constant and the molecule, we can derive the reduced mass and thus derive what our uh, wave numbers of our transition is. So we're going to do this example for F2. Now, spectroscopists don't freak out because you actually can't do infrared uh, spectra on F2 because it doesn't have a dipole moment, but I'm going to ignore that for the moment. We can get it from other ways, from Raman, etc. So I'm going to say that F2, both of these are fluorine 19, and we're going to say that the observed wave numbers of this transition is 916.6 wave numbers. And that falls squarely in the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so omega bar equals 1 over 2 pi c square root of k over mu. So if I multiply both sides by 2 pi c and then square them both and then multiply by mu, what I'll solve is that k equals 4 pi squared c squared mu omega bar squared. So now I need to compute what mu is for my fluorine atom. So in atomic mass units, that's m1, m2 over m1 plus m2. That's 19 times 19 over 19 plus 19, or 19 over 2 AMUs. 1 AMU is equal to 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So 9.5 AMUs is 1.5775 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Again, these being atoms, which are only a couple protons and neutrons, very, very tiny, tiny mass. Okay, so we'll substitute in that value, k equals 4 pi squared, speed of light in centimeters per second, 2.9979 times 10 to the 10th, uh, our mass in kilograms times our frequency in wave numbers squared, gives us that k equals 470.2 newtons per meter. So every meter that our atoms displace away from their equilibrium bond length, they would feel 470 newtons of force pushing them back towards equilibrium. So this is actually a fairly typical size for what these spring constants are. Typically you measure them in the hundreds of newtons per meter. And newtons per meter, as I mentioned, ends up working out in units because centimeters per second squared times kilograms times 1 over centimeters squared is what the units are up here. Uh, the centimeters cancel on the top and the bottom. We're left with kilograms per second squared. Uh, one newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So a kilogram per second squared equals kilogram meter per second squared times 1 over meter. And that indeed gives us one newton per meter, just as we expect for the unit of this force constant, how much force do we get per given unit of displacement?